King George the Third and Hannah Lightfoot by J. A. Brendan. This is a LibriVox recording. Read in honor of the twelfth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The reputed marriage of King George the Third and Hannah Lightfoot is one of the most profound and fascinating mysteries in all the annals of romance. Nothing can be proved with certainty concerning it. It is as traditional as the story of King Alfred burning the cakes. For this reason, some people cleverly maintain that Hannah Lightfoot was a myth. But this is ridiculous. Undoubtedly she existed. Undoubtedly King George the Third, as Prince of Wales, met her, loved her, and eloped with her. But what happened after this, no man can tell. The veil of mystery is impenetrable. Did the prince marry her? Did he have children by her? Where did she live? When did she die? One can only conjecture. Documentary evidence is scant and unreliable. Still, there are countless legends, and legend invariably is based at least on fact. Besides, so many are the legends, and from such different sources do they spring that it would be absurd to regard them all as fiction. In detail, they may be false. In substance, they must be true. And it is from this tangled mass of legend and tradition that the story of the romance, as printed on these pages, has been woven into a consecutive narrative. Of course, it cannot claim to be authentic. Nonetheless, it approaches surely very near the truth. Perhaps the very mystery which surrounds the facts supports this argument. Secrets are not kept without good reason. The love affairs of most royal personages are common knowledge. King George the Fourth's entanglement with Mrs. Fitzherbert, for example, was recognized even in public. But in that case, there was no need for mystery. The Hanoverian dynasty being then firmly established on the throne, Besides, the Royal Marriage Act of 1772, which made it impossible for a member of the royal family to marry without the king's consent, ipso facto, rendered the union legally invalid. When George III, on the other hand, is alleged to have married Hannah Lightfoot, this bill had not been passed. By right, therefore, the Quaker bride would, in due course, have become queen her descendants heirs to the throne, and the king himself, after his subsequent marriage to Prince Charlotte, guilty of an offence no less than bigamy. Hence the need for secrecy. Yet how that secret came to be preserved is a truth utterly mysterious, though one, it may be, which throws a not ungracious light both upon George and Hannah. The woman, at any rate, be this story more than idle fable, clearly did not marry for position she married because she loved and she asked only for love in return for the love she gave unlike the court ladies of her day hannah was not an ambitious self-seeking woman but in reality the dear sweet simple little quaker girl of legend and as such george loved her loved her dearly of this there can be no doubt not until he became king did he desert her and take to himself a royal consort and he hated himself even then for doing so indeed and this is the truth he yielded to the advice of his ministers only in obedience to that real sense of public duty which was his and which singles him out despite his faults as at least the most sincere and noble-hearted man among the hanoverian kings what Hannah Lightfoot meant to him, he told to no man. This stands greatly to his credit, for he lived, it must be remembered, in an age when a man was esteemed among his fellows, 
in proportion to the number and the daring of his love affairs it was fashionable to be a cad the status of women in fact and the ideal of womanhood never have been lower than they were during the days of george's boyhood marriage was a mere name a farce a convenience and at any rate prior to the passing of the act for the preventing of clandestine marriages in seventeen fifty three an act incidentally which met with unqualified opposition from almost every section of the community the holy state of matrimony was literally an odious commodity bought and sold in an open market between october nineteenth seventeen o four and february twelfth seventeen o five no fewer than two thousand nine hundred and forty two marriages were solemnized at the fleet alone without the publication of bans even without license whilst at his chapel in brookfield market-place now curzon street the notorious alexander keith united in a single day as many as one hundred couples this amazing gentleman readily dispensed with all formality he asked no awkward questions he made no inquiries the presence of witnesses provided of course that he received his fees he regarded as quite unnecessary he did not even insist upon the signing of the register and on more than one occasion he is said to have married a woman to another woman in order to enable her thereby to evade her debts by saying that she had a husband somewhere who could be held responsible for them now keith was but one among many the church in fact had fallen into a lamentable state of debasement and her servants especially the lower clergy tempted no doubt by the wretched smallness of their stipends instead of acting as the guardians of morality grew fat and rich and profligate by legalizing vice on several occasions pennant declared writing in seventeen seventy eight while walking in the neighborhood of the fleet prison he had been accosted by the parson who prowled up and down outside and tempted with this question sir will you be pleased to walk in and be married and there are countless so-called clergymen willing to perform such ceremonies a dram of gin or a roll of tobacco often proved reward enough yet according to the law bigamy was a crime punishable with death now this state of affairs incredible though it may seem has an important bearing on the story of hannah lightfoot perhaps too it helps further to account for the mystery which surrounds her life at any rate as king george gave ample proof of his good endeavors to preserve the sanctity of marriage in this country and to promote the dignity of women during his reign in fact more was done by legislation to achieve this end than during any other age in history perhaps then one is justified in saying that as prince of wales he had the good taste to rise above the meanness of his environment and to be so foolish as to entertain a pure and noble passion for a pure and noble woman george loved hannah lightfoot loved her as a woman should be loved and reverenced her so he kept his love a secret it was much too precious to be paraded before the vulgar gaze much too sacred to be corroded by the breath of scandal is this an unreasonable theory as a king george the third has been much maligned and there still is a tendency to scoff at and belittle his talents still in spite of all it was while he sat on the throne the britain rose at last triumphant amid her enemies and established the mightiest empire in the world the work of great ministers you say true but he is a great king who knows how to use to the full the genius of his servants surely then one may at least credit him with ideals both as a monarch and a man these ideals his mother implanted in him she was a really good woman perhaps this explains her intense unpopularity in the country and from the very outset determined to prevent her son from being tainted by the profligacy of the court and the court of his grandfather king george the second was notorious even among the notorious courts of europe 
but the heir to the throne thanks to a mother's wisdom passed his childhood in comparative seclusion at leicester house there he lived in an atmosphere of almost suburban respectability nor did he suffer through it on the contrary although a son of the disreputable frederick lewis prince of wales he grew to become a clean healthy-minded young englishman a nice boy one writer calls him it is a fitting description brilliant he may not have been but he possessed a goodly store of common sense and to a prince this is a quality perhaps of greater value even than our brains what is more unlike his forebears he was gifted with imagination and something approaching a real love for beauty thus he became a patron of the arts not merely because he happened to have been born a prince but because he appreciated lovely things and liked to associate with and use his power of honouring those who made them is it to be wondered at then that he became a sentimentalist surely it is only the natural corollary at any rate he did become a sentimentalist and this is the only answer that can be given to those who laugh at the suggestion that at the age of fifteen and a half he could have fallen seriously in love this and the fact that at the age of fifteen and a half he did fall seriously in love and needless to say with a woman much older than himself but in those days it was only fit and proper for a boy to fall in love one could not begin too young besides there is such a thing as calf love what does calverley say the people say that she was blue but i was green and loved her dearly she was approaching thirty-two and i was eleven nearly some authorities incidentally declare that george was only eleven years of age when first he met hannah lightfoot this it would seem is doubtful none the less there is a delightful picture of the boy prince dallying during a stay at hampton court with the object of his youthful passion on richmond hill there lives a lass more bright than may day morn whose charms all other maids surpass a rose without a thorn this lass so neat with smile so sweet hath won my right good will i crowns resign to call thee mine sweet lass of richmond hill still one must pass the story by as fable besides there is no need to burden hannah lightfoot with the onerous role of the sweet lass of richmond hill she is sufficiently fascinating alone as the fair quaker and as george first saw her some time later in fact one evening when going to the opera with his parents two now the opera house then occupied the site at present filled by his majesty's theatre and apparently at the back of the building was an entrance specially reserved for the use of the royal family this door opened into market street a narrow passage which ran from pall mall to germain street now at the pall mall corner of market street stood the shop of a certain mr wheeler a linen draper and it would seem a successful one perhaps because he always kept a cask of good ale with which to regale his customers now it was there sitting in the shop window to watch the royal procession pass that prince george first saw hannah lightfoot at the time he could have had but a fleeting glance of her for the royal party were as usual proceeding to the opera in chairs attended only by footmen and perhaps a dozen yeomen of the guard but that one glance was enough george had seen and had been conquered nor later did the vision of the blushing maiden's beauty prove to have been a sweet illusion but how came hannah to be at mr wheeler's shop well partly because mr wheeler was a quaker and therefore a man given to good works but chiefly because he had need of somebody to assist him in the management of his business and incidentally of his large and growing family as a matter of fact hannah was his niece the only daughter it would seem of his sister mary whose husband matthew lightfoot shoemaker of wapping had died in seventeen thirty two leaving his family in desperate poverty perhaps then the girl had been fortunate to find a home in her uncle's house 
but she had to work there. Indeed, every moment of her day was occupied. Not that she objected, for being a Quaker, work came to her as second nature. Still, despite her Quaker training, perhaps because of it, she took a very live interest in the grand world and in people of high degree. So it happened that on the evening in question, she came to be sitting in the shop window, after closing hour, a demure and charming little figure. Now perhaps it was this, her very simplicity, which won Prince George's fancy. In her sombre but dainty Quaker dress, unpainted, unpatched, quite free from artificiality, she must have appeared in delightfully refreshing contrast to the ladies with whom normally he came in contact. For, as already has been said, George was a nice boy, and without a doubt the little shop girl was very beautiful. Indeed, an unknown writer has declared, quote, with her dainty little head running over with golden curls, large blue eyes dancing with merriment or mischief, dimpled cheeks with a bloom as delicate as any peach, and with as petite a figure as that of a sylph, we cannot wonder that Hannah, whose charms were enhanced by her demure Quaker dress, set going pit a pat the hearts of every gallant whose eyes fell on so fair a vision. End quote. Unfortunately, this dainty description does not tally with the only known portrait of Hannah, a painting by Sir Joshua Reynolds. And why did Sir Joshua paint her, if this story be all a myth? Here she is seen as a dark-eyed girl, with an expression hauntingly sad and pensive. But this picture belongs to a later date, when sorrow had already told its tale upon her face. Still petite, Hannah most certainly could not have been short it is true she was but short and plump rather disposed to embonpoint one critic tactfully remarked and as quote, the possessor of a fair unsullied face end quote, she could not fail we are told to attract attention at a time when smallpox had left but few women unmarked be this as it may hannah was pretty fact and legend are unanimous bewitchingly pretty she enslaved the prince immediately one glance was enough henceforth he found frequent occasion to attend the opera market street came invariably to be included in the itinerary of his daily walks and daily rides and it is said he used often to visit mr wheeler's shop and there for i suspect that mr wheeler dealt mainly in ladies underclothing by the most useless and absurd apparel now could hannah have been so innocent as not to guess the reason of this patronage she may have been a simple little maid but still she was a woman and somewhere within her woman's soul she must have entertained a woman's hopes ambitions and love for admiration and the admiration of prince george it was not a gift lightly to be waved aside he was an attractive boy taller than most of the hanoveran princes strong well made and dignified with a clear complexion regular features twinkling eyes and the very whitest of white teeth in fact he was just what an english prince should be and his smile it even turned the hearts of the blase ladies about court but they never saw the ardent love glances which hannah saw surely then although he was six or seven years her junior clad in his princely clothes his hair powdered a jewelled sword at his side he must have appeared to hannah a veritable god what a contrast to the men she was accustomed to meet in her uncle's parlour yet that he would ever deign to speak to her she hardly ventured to imagine even in her dreams but the prince for his part soon began to see that it would be quite impossible for him to rest content for ever worshipping from afar with only an occasional stolen word upon which to feed his love something must be done and done immediately that became very clear so he set about forthwith to find a someone in whom he could confide and who would help him to gain the entree to that mysterious inner room in mr wheeler's house but whom could he seek that was his difficulty 
the problem certainly was one which called for very discreet and serious consideration three now george was no fool and in selecting that someone he displayed a wisdom worthy of a more mature experienced man in short his choice fell upon elizabeth chudleigh the arch adventuress of the day the very woman to do what he required of her she had begun life in quite a humble way but owing partly to her own determination and partly to her beauty had secured at an absurdly early age the appointment of maid of honour to george's mother the princess of wales and at court despite the princess's strict notions on decorum she contrived to lead a life of reckless gaiety until after playing havoc with the hearts of every available and eligible member of the peerage she condescended eventually to bestow her hand upon the youthful duke of hamilton while he was abroad however completing his education she carried on a violent flirtation with a young naval officer called hervey of course merely pour passer le thème for hervey being only a nephew to the earl of bristol was in elizabeth's eyes hardly worth worrying about although it is true he stood a very fair chance of succeeding to the barony of howard de walden and a half of the estates of the earl of portsmouth still what was this in comparison to a dukedom a mere nothing but alas contrary to the old adage about fond hearts and absence her duckle lover while abroad seemed to forget completely the existence of the fair enchantress awaiting him at home never a word did she hear from him and as perhaps was only natural piqued by the seeming indifference she allowed her affair with the other man to become more serious until at last partly because she could see no other means of satisfying hervey's adoration but mainly because the idea struck her as being romantic and bizarre she eloped with him what she had done in haste she began immediately to repent at leisure indeed the folly of her act was only too apparent and to make matters worse she did not even like the man whom she had married how could she then have been so silly she angrily demanded of herself as to endanger her position at court by contracting such an alliance fortunately hervey had gone to sea soon after the ceremony for the present then her secret was safe of course many people must have guessed the truth but this did not perturb elizabeth greatly she made a point of knowing so many of other people's secrets that nobody dared retail her own she knew this and so when it suited her convenience she had no compunction in herself declaring the marriage null and void nor did she even trouble to secure a judicial confirmation of her own decree it was absurd she thought to regard so haphazard and slipshod a contract as legally binding in seventeen sixty nine therefore when the opportunity presented itself she allowed herself duly and without a single twinge of conscience to be wedded to the duke of kingston the wedding was the most brilliant social function of the season for days it was the talk of london and king george the third accompanied by his queen attended the ceremony in person no sooner had she become duchess of kingston than hervey quite unexpectedly succeeded to a vast fortune in the earldom of bristol such a contingency elizabeth never for a moment had anticipated she had no idea that even fate could be so whimsical still she did not allow the humour of the situation to be wasted on her and found much comfort in the thought it was certainly more interesting to be a duchess and a bigamist than merely a humdrum respectable countess still she was somewhat worried her present position to say the least of it was dangerous but for a while everything went well so well in fact that elizabeth was just beginning to think she needlessly alarmed herself when with a paralyzing suddenness the bomb of her own creation burst she found herself called upon to answer to a charge of bigamy at the time she was abroad in rome i believe where she had just been received with almost regal honours by the pope and nothing was further from her mind than the publicity of the law courts at any rate 
so she consoled herself the inevitable must happen sooner or later undaunted therefore she claimed her rights as countess of bristol and insisted on the case being heard in the house of lords of course she lost it but defeat did not drain her resources england had become impossible to her that was all so she set about to find fresh worlds to conquer and what is more she conquered them first the court of russia then that of frederick the great such then was the woman whom prince george chose as his confidant and how could he have made a wiser choice one surely can picture elizabeth listening to the shy story of his love caressing him with her voice sympathizing with his chivalry promising her help and all the while wondering how much she stood to make out of the transaction for in these the early days of her career money was essential to her she had none save what she earned by her wits but george no doubt cared nothing for the expense at any rate when he found that his agent arranged everything to perfection and enabled him to keep safe and secret trysts with his little quaker girl at the house of a certain mr perrin who lived in the village of knightsbridge these meetings were very bliss indeed they amply justified the cost and since mr perrin was one of hannah's uncles his house of course was an eminently proper place of meeting elizabeth chudleigh must have wheedled the man very cleverly indeed despite his austere quakerism she made him quite romantic and when he died he left hannah an annuity of forty pounds but before long news of these secret meetings reached the ears of the prince's mother and his tutor the earl of bute they very easily put one and one together and although they thought the affair to be merely a youthful infatuation decided that it must be stopped immediately but how to whom could so delicate a mission be entrusted why not to elizabeth chudleigh bute hated the woman she knew too much about him none the less he admitted her qualifications in his opinion he said the princess could not make a better choice and so the matter was settled for elizabeth needless to say accepted the task readily the situation appealed to her it seemed to provide infinite possibilities of artistic treatment besides with careful management her dual duties should prove highly remunerative first then she set to work to pacify the prince's mother there was nothing to worry about she said a husband must be found for hannah that was all probably she would live very happily with him and king kofetua would very soon forget his little beggar maid what could be simpler then no doubt she spun a similar story to mr wheeler appealing to his quaker conscience to assist her in removing the girl from danger now mr wheeler thoroughly alarmed by mistress chudleigh's words until then he had no idea that the blight of royal favor had fallen on one of the daughters of his house readily agreed to every proposition that she made in fact he knew not how to be grateful enough to this dazzling lady who had come from court most graciously to help him in his hour of need and to avert from his quaker home so unthinkable a tragedy as scandal together the two of them the anxious draper and the arch adventuress set about to find a mate for hannah eventually they chose a man named axford the son of a grocer who lived on ludgate hill why they selected him it is not easy to understand for he was much younger than hannah and apparently one of the very few men who did not want to marry her but fortunately he was poor and the promise of a handsome dower served admirably as a bribe and indeed it should have a handsome dower a handsome wife grocers assistants do not meet with such offers every day immediately therefore a ceremony was arranged it took place on december eleventh seventeen fifty three at keith's celebrated chapel but hannah cannot one picture her feelings and pity her as she stood before the altar by the side of this mean little grocer's assistant demure obedient little girl she had not courage to resist none the less sorrow and disappointment surged through her pulses quote, place not your trust in princes 
place not your trust in princes. End quote. The saying echoed and re echoed through her mind. Now, at last, she realized its truth. And yet, was not her prince, her George, the very pattern of all chivalry? Oh, why then, she prayed, as mechanically she swore, to love, cherish, and to obey a man whom she disliked intensely. Could he not come, and, like the princes of her fairy tales, save her from her hideous fate? That love's young dream should end thus abruptly was more than she could bear. Place and power she cared for neither. Love was all she wanted, the love of her gay young cavalier. Tears, bitter tears, aught but bride-like, welled to her eyes as, leaning on her husband's arm, she walked slowly down the chancel steps, down the aisle, and so out of the church. At that very moment, a coach dashed up, drawn by four steaming horses. It stopped before the church. A man jumped out. A moment later, Hannah was lying helpless in his arms, being lifted bodily into the carriage. A postillion slammed the door. A whip cracked, and before the poor startled little bride had time to realize what was happening, the heavy carriage rolled away, leaving the new-fledged bridegroom standing, amazed and helpless, in the doorway of the church. Just then, a woman slipped away, unnoticed, through the curious little crowd which had assembled. She had come purposely to witness this comedy, and her eyes sparkled with merriment. The woman was Elizabeth Chudley. And presently, when Hannah dared open her eyes again, she found herself seated in a coach by the side of George, Prince of Wales. Until that dramatic moment when he arrived before the church, the prince, of course, had been sublimely ignorant as to Hannah's intended marriage. But surely he must have realized that something was wrong. Perhaps Elizabeth had told him that his mother was watching him, and that for the present, therefore, he must neither communicate with nor expect to hear from Hannah, no doubt, this explanation satisfied, he trusted his agent implicitly. Then suddenly one morning, the morning of December 11, he received word from her, bidding him hasten to Keith's chapel with all speed, prepared for any emergency. Forthwith he summoned his coach. By some strange chance he found it ready, waiting, jumped in, and set out for Mayfair. Not a moment had been wasted, and he arrived before Keith's chapel, just as the bride and bridegroom were emerging. At a glance he realized the situation. To delay, obviously, would be fatal. With scant courtesy, therefore, as already has been shown, he pushed Master Axford on one side, his body quivering with emotion, his eyes aflame with love and anger, seized Hannah in his arms, and bundled her into the coach, shouting to the postillions to drive, drive anywhere, they had already received their orders, and the coach rumbled off. But Master Axford, what of him? What did he do? For a moment, dazed and bewildered by the suddenness of the unexpected, he knew not what to think, or how to act. At this one cannot wonder. Romance, romance with a big R, very, very rarely penetrated the small world in which he lived. He was merely a grocer's assistant, quite dull, very respectable. And really... The situation in which he found himself might have surprised a man very much more experienced in such matters. Yet Master Axford, for all that, was a man of spirit. It is true he cared but little for Hannah. He had married mainly for her dower, and that he had received already. Nonetheless, he could not stand tamely by and allow her to be kidnapped on her wedding day before his very eyes. No man can tolerate being fooled. So he called bravely for a horse. Someone lent him one. He mounted in haste, and perhaps none too gracefully, gathered the reins in his hands, and set out in hot pursuit. But a long start had been secured by the prince's coach, and now it appeared no more than a speck in the far distance. Still, the untrammeled horseman gained ground rapidly, and soon approached within hailing distance. At yonder turnpike, surely he could not fail to overtake the fugitives. He dared even to rein in his horse a little, and summoning all the courage and dignity at his command, schooled himself for the great moment. But then, Royal family, royal family, he could hear the voice of the postillion clearly. Instantly the gates swung open, 
and the coach passed through without being checked even for a moment in its mad reckless course but before the horseman could follow the heavy barrier had closed again with a clang of triumph zounds utterly exasperated and indeed not without reason master axford waxed angry and fumbled in his pockets for a coin haste made him clumsy and his indignation instead of hurrying the turnpike man only provoked him to ribald merriment thus several precious minutes were wasted before the outraged husband found himself again upon the road and by that time the coach had already disappeared from sight still he hastened forward and now with a renewed determination until at length he arrived at cross roads here his troubles began in very earnest which way had the fugitives taken he could only guess so he tried each road in turn but without success he had lost them lost them utterly and from then until the day of his death he neither saw nor heard again from hannah lightfoot she vanished completely nor can posterity even trace her wanderings what remains to be told of her history is pure conjecture that on april seventeenth seventeen fifty nine she went through some form of marriage with the prince of wales this may be accepted as tolerably authentic what happened subsequently is all mysterious it would seem however that after he had successfully eluded master axford the prince drove hannah to some safe place of refuge either at kew or richmond perhaps ultimately he took her to the house of his old friend mr perrin of knightsbridge there at any rate he could continue his rudely interrupted wooing without further danger and without offending the proprieties while making definite arrangement for the future something of this sort must have happened since for a while hannah continued to communicate regularly with her mother these letters though not available for reproduction are it is said still in existence and in them frequent reference is made to a person a certain person the person now who could this person have been master axford no surely not hannah had no occasion to allude to him so guardedly then the prince ah who else and in her letters hannah makes it clear how much she loved him and how implicitly she trusted him so long as it was in his keeping she had no fear for the future at this time then george must have had at any rate free and easy access to her but quite suddenly those letters ceased and thenceforth it is impossible to find anywhere an authentic reference to hannah lightfoot what happened no man can tell even legend is silent perhaps someone betrayed the lovers or perhaps this is the most likely theory bute and the prince's mother for a second time surprised their secret and forthwith took steps possibly again with elizabeth chudley's connivance to whisk the girl away to some place where george could not even hope to find her but this as it may in some way the secret leaked out for something happened which made it necessary for the prince and hannah temporarily at any rate to separate and it is a significant fact that at about this same time the society of friends should solemnly have expelled hannah from their order it would be ridiculous to maintain that so severe a step was taken simply because she married isaac axford he was an eminently respectable young man quite eligible and although not himself a quaker certainly came of a quaker family moreover although the society of friends discussed the affairs of hannah lightfoot at several meetings not once is her husband mentioned by name in the minute book surely then it was not to the oxford marriage that the good quakers took exception but to hannah's subsequent entanglement with the prince the quakers certainly knew something something which they dare not voice in public or in that plain spoken language which is the proud boast of their order but george was far too ardent a young wooer to be baffled by so small an obstacle as the disappearance of his lady love find her he would he swore to himself that he would never rest until he had mystery only whetted his determination and find her he did eventually where or when or how is not on record all that can be said is that he found her and that on april seventeenth seventeen fifty nine he married her but how could he marry her 
was she not already wedded to Isaac Axford? Footnote. According to one theory, the prince really was married to Hannah Lightfoot at Keith's Chapel on December 11, 1753, Axford acting merely as proxy at the ceremony. This is an ingenious belief and by no means unromantic, nor does it disprove the story as narrated in these pages. On the contrary, it merely makes it necessary to regard the subsequent elopement as a splendid piece of bluff, magnificently stage-managed, perfectly acted, and this, perhaps, is not at all improbable. End of footnote. Of course she was, but according to the terms of the Act for Preventing Clandestine Marriages, the marriage would certainly have been held invalid. Now, although it did not come into force until Lady Day, 1754, the bill had been passed by Parliament in June, 1753, six months prior to the Axford Lightfoot wedding. From its provisions, moreover, Jews, Quakers, both sects have strict ceremonials of their own, and members of the royal family were deliberately excluded. It might have been passed, then, directly to accommodate George and Hannah, for Axford, being neither Jew nor Quaker, was bound down to his terms, whilst Hannah, being a Quaker, and George, a member of the royal family, were left free to marry as they liked. The Society of Friends alone could take exception to Hannah's actions, and they had taken exception already, and emphatically. And then again, even the conscientious Master Axford eventually took the law into his own hands, and without troubling to have his former marriage rescinded, led another woman to the altar, this time the lady of his choice, a certain Mary Bartlett. Before taking the step, it is true, he waited six long years, and left no stone unturned which might reveal a clue to Hannah's whereabouts, so perhaps one cannot regard his action as unjustified, nor was it so rash as it, nor was it so rash as it may seem. At any rate, Master Axford had no occasion to fear a charge of bigamy, since a public inquiry into his affairs would clearly lead to undesirable disclosures. Even he was shrewd enough to realize this, and shrewd enough, moreover, to delay his marriage with Mary Bartlett until the summer of 1759. Now George is alleged to have married Hannah Lightfoot in the April of that selfsame year. Certainly, then, it would seem that Axford had heard of that ceremony, heard enough at any rate to make him feel safe in following his future monarch's lead. But did George go through a form of marriage with Hannah Lightfoot? That is the important question. Officially, of course, the marriage has been denied repeatedly. Reasons of state have rendered such denials necessary. Nonetheless, a just and impartial consideration of the evidence can lead only to one verdict. In the first place, although hot-headed and impetuous, George, Prince of Wales, was not a rake. He was a nice boy, and it is most improbable that he would have been content merely with an irregular alliance. And it is surely still more improbable that Hannah ever would have sanctioned such a tie, even with the prince. She had been trained strictly as a Quaker, and is known to have been a girl with deep convictions. Nor did George escape their influence. He always took great interest in the Quaker movement. Again, there is the evidence of the marriage certificate. As a matter of fact, this probably is worthless, for two certificates have been produced. According to the one, a ceremony was performed at Kew, according to the other, at Peckham. But both agree as to the name of the officiating clergyman. Both, moreover, agree as to the date, and the contention that some sort of wedding did take place is perhaps supported by the following document. Quote, this is to certify to all it may concern that I lawfully married George, Prince of Wales, to Hannah Lightfoot, April 17, 1759, and the two sons and a daughter were their issue by such marriage. J. Wilmot, Chatham, J. Dunning. End quote. Now this and all other papers relating to the marriage were produced in court in 1866, during the hearing of the celebrated case of Rives v. Attorney General. Of course they were condemned as forgeries. The judges had no alternative. But it is interesting to note that they gave this opinion in spite of the fact that the handwriting expert called in by the Crown 
a certain Mr. Nethercliffe, a man of standing and sure integrity, declared them to be genuine. A fiercely searching cross-examination could not shake his belief that George himself had signed the alleged certificates. Of Wilmot's signature, he was absolutely certain, and he honestly believed those of Chatham and Dunham also to be genuine. All these documents, moreover, since have been impounded, and although kept at Somerset House, nobody may see them, not even by paying the customary shilling. Perhaps, then, in spite of everything, the story is not altogether mythical. 5. Be this as it may, the lover's married happiness, at any rate, could not have lasted long. Indeed, barely had they been made man and wife, when a new and crushing misfortune befell them. George, Prince of Wales, found himself suddenly raised to the dignity of king, and in one moment Love's castle, so laboriously constructed, fell to the ground, shattered like a house of cards. To be a king, in fact, as well as name, the prince had been born and nursed and trained. George B. King. From earliest childhood, an adoring mother had preached this doctrine in his ears. To see him a great ruler, not merely a figurehead, was the summit of her ambitions. Nor was she to be disappointed. The seeds of her advice had not fallen upon barren ground. Indeed, from the moment that he became king, George the Third resolved to be king and to be a good king. The magic force of power seized hold of him, and held him spellbound, while within him dawned the consciousness of a great responsibility. Kingship eliminated his manhood, self became absorbed in duty, and before this his duty to his country, his duty to the dynasty he represented, all other obligations faded into nothingness. Opportunity in short had made the man, not the man the opportunity. But as king, it behooved him, before all things, to ensure the Protestant secession. Hitherto the sage advice of counsellors who urged him to take a royal consort to himself had moved him only to anger. Now all was different. He needed an heir. His people demanded one of him. And so, after long and anxious communion with himself, but were his true feelings one can only imagine, he informed his astonished ministers that he had, quote, come to a resolution to demand in marriage the Princess Charlotte of mecklenburg strelitz a princess distinguished by every eminent virtue and amiable endowment. End quote. He had never seen the lady, but rumor declared her to be thoroughly domesticated and very simple. So George, perhaps, hoped to find in her a meek and worthy consort, who would be able to interest herself in the welfare of his poorer subjects without demanding from him a love that he could never give. Forthwith, then, he sent Lord Harcourt to her with the formal offer of his hand. The princess was darning stockings when the ambassador arrived, nor did she consider the nature of his mission sufficiently important to justify her in ceasing work. In fact, she listened to the proposal with the most astonishing indifference, and expressed herself quite willing to comply with the King of England's wishes, and after submitting to the customary ordeal of a marriage by proxy, straightway set out to meet her husband. It was not a romantic scene, the meeting. Charlotte looked bored. George was absurdly nervous, though he assured his mother later in the evening that he already felt a great affection for the bride. This was very tactful for him, although amiable. Charlotte could not lay claim to beauty. Quote, her person, according to Horace Walpole, was small and very lean, not well made, her face pale and homely, her nose somewhat flat and mouth very large. End quote. But, despite these personal defects, Queen Charlotte proved herself one of the best of the wives of the kings of England. Even Walpole was impressed by the beauty of her hair. The people adored her, and George at any rate respected and admired her always. She almost won his love. Perhaps she would have, had it not been bestowed already. But to Hannah this gift had brought little comfort, now that disgrace and contumely had been heaped upon it. George, he who had sworn eternal love and loyalty to her, had been faithless. It was this which stabbed her like a knife. She did not understand that duty could ever demand so big a sacrifice. A tender, clinging little wife, she was not a great adventuress, gambling with life, 
or just a woman innocent and very human a little shop girl who loved with all her simple soul position held no attractions for her she cared not for place and power still she was george's wife and if she could not be his queen surely no other woman could be they were tears of shame not jealousy which dimmed her eyes to think that in return for all that she had given she must go out into the world in exile and be forced to wander homeless and forlorn from place to place so that no man might know who or where she was it seemed a cruel fate all that was left to her was a memory the memory of what might have been and yet brave little soul for the sake of this memory she cheerfully obeyed love's bidding after all then this is a very human story despite its complications and calamities nor can even the glamour of romance deprive it of its sadness there are no letters it is true no treasured relics to recall the anxious achings of hannah's wounded heart but this surely only makes her love the more pathetic and the more noble for not a single word of bitterness did she leave behind her and only one of protest hannah regina thus proudly she signed her will during her lifetime she made no endeavour to assert her rights this she did for george's sake she did not wish to make his task more difficult and he was not ungrateful or unsympathetic they who suffer in silence suffer most he knew this and although he could not bring peace and happiness to the woman he had wronged he did not forget her children and his the daughter ultimately married an officer in the indian army and of the sons the elder settled eventually in america after fighting bravely in the war of independence for his father and his king but the younger it would seem was sent to south africa and there given a large estate on condition that he would neither marry nor return to england in his case precautions were necessary for it is said he was the living image of his father but what did queen charlotte know probably everything george himself it may be told her the truth at any rate so long as hannah lived she did not believe herself to be the king's lawful wife and after hannah's death insisted that he should marry her again the ceremony was performed secretly at kew in seventeen sixty five the exact date is not known nor is the place of hannah's burial but she did not die unmourned Quote, my father would have been a happier man king george the fourth is reported to have said had he remained true to his marriage with hannah lightfoot End quote. perhaps he would and maybe it was not merely the heavy crown of kingship which later deprived him of his reason there are heavier burdens for the mind to bear even than the cares of state End of king george the third and Hannah Lightfoot by J. A. Brandon Read by Greg Giordano The Love Story of Miss Twelve and Captain Seven by Mrs. C. N. Williamson This is a LibriVox recording read in honor of the twelfth anniversary of librivox all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org if only he cared about getting well it would be such a help but he doesn't seem to one bit thought the little nurse gazing anxiously down at the closed eyes of her patient he was a handsome patient although he was so white and thin Perhaps, if he had not been handsome, if he had been old and ugly and uninteresting and fat, instead of a brave young soldier, she might not have been quite so anxious, for she was young too, and human, very human. But she was not conscious that her sympathy for him depended upon anything more subtle than his suffering. He had long black eyelashes, almost too good to waste on a man, the little nurse had said to a companion when he first came under her care but she did not think now that they were too good for him. She sat watching his face, reviewing the many days since he had come to the nursing home to have the bullet, which had hidden itself for so long, extracted, and to get well afterwards. But why didn't he get well? He ought to have shown signs of improvement a week ago. 
Suddenly the black lashes quivered, lifted, and his eyes looked straight up to hers. "'What is it, nurse?' he asked. "'It's time for you to take your medicine,' she answered, with the soft, dimpled smile which seemed somehow to match well with the dove-gray uniform, the long white apron, and the little cap with the stiffly starched band and bow under the chin. "'What's the good?' he muttered, while he resignedly drank the stuff she poured into a glass. "'To make you well.' "'But what's the good of being made well? "'I've nothing particular to live for now. "'I don't grudge anything, of course. "'But it's hard lines, you know.' "'She did know. "'She understood that, though the surgeons and doctors "'meant to turn him out of the nursing home cured, "'he would have to give up his promising career in the army. "'And he had suffered a good deal during all the two years "'since he had got his wound, and DSO, in West Africa. "'There are other things,' she suggested cheeringly. "'I suppose there are.' only I don't see them yet. Somebody had said that there was a girl, a girl who had pretended to care for him, and then thrown him over, but that was gossip. Just then, before she had thought what answer to make, which might reveal to the poor, tired fellow a hundred new interests in life, something fell on the floor of the room above. I didn't know there was anybody up there, he said. It's always been as quiet as the grave, night and day. She only came this morning, replied the little nurse. For a moment she paused. Then a bright light flashed in her grey eyes. Ah, she exclaimed, if you were like her now, you would have something to complain of. Why, what's the matter with her? he inquired, more because he saw that the nurse expected him to be interested than because he really was. Not a question had he asked since his arrival about any other inmate of the house. There might be dozens, or there might be none except himself for all he knew. The nurse shook her head. "'Poor girl,' she sighed. "'She's so young and so beautiful, "'and a little while ago she had everything on earth to live for. "'Now what has she? "'And yet you should see how brave she is. "'Why, it's wonderful.' "'This time he did not have to feign interest. "'Who is the girl you're talking about?' he asked. "'Nurse hesitated. "'Oh, you know it's against the rules of the house "'for us to mention the name of one patient to another. "'I didn't know. "'Well, it is. "'But... I'll call her Miss Twelve. Her room's number twelve. What am I, then? We always speak of you, when we do speak, as Captain Seven. He laughed a little. Oh, yes, I remember now. I've heard the pros in the corridor outside say to each other, When is Seven's breakfast coming up? But you were going to tell me about Miss Twelve. Poor Miss Twelve. Well, she's perfectly beautiful, and she can't be more than twenty-one. How any man could jilt her! But one did, on account of her eyes— and he's married another girl and gone on to the continent, leaving her, leaving twelve, to suffer. He doesn't care. She loved him, and besides, he was rich. Oh, very rich. And she... she's lost every penny she had in the world. That's a bad lookout, said Captain Seven, sympathetically. Yes. And her father and mother were both killed in a railway accident only a short time ago. That was when she learned that she wouldn't have any money. Her father had had great losses, he was a historian who wrote books and knew nothing about business, and had trusted to a friend to make his investments. They had all gone wrong, and the friend had deceived him. Now Twelve is left alone in the world, with no father and mother, no lover, no money, and perhaps no eyesight. "'By Jove, what a cruel story!' exclaimed Captain Seven, waking up to generous interest and looking more alive than the nurse had seen him look since he knew the worst about himself." "'But what a lot you've managed to find out about this poor girl "'who's only been in the house since this morning.' "'The nurse blushed faintly, as if she had been accused of undue curiosity. "'I knew some of the story beforehand,' she explained. "'The part about her father being a historian, "'and the railway accident, and the loss of the money. "'The other part I... I found out since. "'Not that she would tell such things about herself, but... "'Well, you mustn't ask how I learned that.' "'No, I won't. "'But tell me more about her,' he said. "'Is there danger that she will be blind?' "'I'm afraid there is,' sighed the little nurse. "'And she's got such glorious eyes. "'You never saw eyes as lovely, "'and you wouldn't dream anything was wrong with them. "'What color are they?' he asked. "'Violet, with dark lashes.' "'You seem to be an admirer of beauty,' said Captain Seven, smiling, "'and looking more critically at the little nurse than he had looked yet. "'He thought that she was a pretty girl, "'though nothing very wonderful, of course,' "'and her voice was as soft as the notes of a flute. "'Go on and describe Miss Twelve, he commanded. "'The nurse was delighted at her success in rousing her patient. 
"'Well,' she began, slowly, as if she were endeavouring to recall each detail. "'Golden hair, all in great waves and quantities of it. It must come nearly down to her knees. It's such a bright colour it makes her eyes look dark. Good complexion? Exquisite. Like a lily. But her lips are red. "'Dimples?' suggested Captain Seven, his eyes happening to light upon those of the nurse. She grew pink. "'I believe so. And one in her chin. Her nose is perfect, quite Greek, and the loveliest mouth. It's the kind I've heard called a cupid's bow.' "'Why, she must be a goddess,' said Seven. "'But perhaps her figure isn't good. She can't have everything, you know.' "'Oh, she has. Everything except happiness and good fortune.' The nurse broke the thread of her sentence hastily. "'Her figure is beautiful, too, just as beautiful as her face, slender and tall, and her hands and feet are the sweetest things.' "'And yet you say some brute of a fellow has jilted this heavenly creature,' exclaimed Captain Seven. "'Yes, the monster, because she may be blind and need him all the more.' "'Ought to have his neck wrung,' grumbled the young man. "'But then we only know one side of the story, don't we? "'Maybe Miss Twelve has a beast of a temper, or something.' "'Oh, if you saw her, you would be certain she couldn't have,' the little nurse protested, quite indignantly. "'Of course, she hasn't been here long enough for us to really know her yet, but she seems to have an angelic disposition. And you can generally tell a good deal about people's dispositions when they're suffering.' "'Poor girl. Is she suffering now?' "'Dreadfully. Every minute. To say nothing of what all her grief and anxiety must be. But she laughs and says witty things through it all. "'She's got twice my pluck.' said Captain Seven, with a sigh. "'Well, she's certainly an example to everybody.' "'What are you going to do to her?' asked the young man, apprehensively. "'Will it be an operation?' The little nurse nodded, with pursed mouth. "'It's against our rules to talk much about one patient to another,' she said. "'Still, as you are so interested, and don't know her name, it can't do any harm. "'There'll be an operation tomorrow. "'You'll smell the ether coming up from the theatre, I expect.' "'Heavens, how awful! And she's got no one with her. No friends to see her through, poor child?' "'No one at all. You must wish her well.' "'Indeed I do, and will,' said Captain Seven earnestly. He thought for a minute, and then went on rather shyly. "'I'd like her to know that there's someone in the house who will be thinking about her, and hoping for the best, the very best.' "'She shall know,' the little nurse answered. "'I'll tell her myself. She isn't one of my patients.' I have you and five and six. She has a special, but I relieve special sometimes when she goes out, and I'll take the message. Only you had better not talk about twelve to any of the other nurses or the pros, because professionally I oughtn't to have told you about her. Hang professionally, as if it mattered a rap, exclaimed Seven. But of course I wouldn't get you into trouble for the world. You're a perfect little saint to me, and you may depend I won't breathe a word that I've ever heard of Miss Twelve. "'You'll give me news of her, though, won't you, whenever you can? "'Naturally, after all you've told me, I shall be anxious to know.' "'The nurse assured him that he might depend upon her, "'and that same evening she had some news to give. "'Captain Seven's message had been duly delivered, "'and Miss Twelve thanked him very much. "'She had sent word that Seven's kind thought would help her through tomorrow. "'It warmed the young man's heart to hear this, "'and when he remembered... And when he remembered what tomorrow meant for that poor, lonely, lovely creature upstairs, a stinging sensation in the lids made him want to close his eyes. "'I told Twelve something about you,' went on the little nurse, timidly. "'Did you? What did you tell her? That I was a helpless wretch, who makes you lots of trouble and whose career is ruined—' "'Indeed, I didn't tell her anything of the kind,' almost snapped the nurse. "'I said you were a soldier, a captain in the army, who had done splendidly brave things—' "'and though you were going to leave the army, "'because for a few years you mightn't have quite your old strength "'in your right arm and hand, "'it wouldn't really matter to you so very much. "'You could be quite happy, "'for you had a place in the country and plenty of friends and enough money, "'and you could travel.' "'There, there,' laughed Seven. "'That's a long enough list of my blessings, thank you. "'But compared to what that poor child seems to have to look forward to, "'I have everything left to be thankful for.' "'So Twelve said, and she's so glad. "'She told me to say that she envied you.' and yet she wouldn't rob you of one of those good things, even if she could change. She likes brave soldiers, and she feels sure you deserve every consolation you have, and more. She really must be an angel, exclaimed the young man. I told you she was, said the nurse. 
"'I suppose I have got consolations, as she calls them,' he soliloquized aloud. "'By Jove, I must try and be more grateful. "'Tell Miss Twelve I said so when you thank her for me, "'and say that, if she cares to hear it, she has done me good.' "'I will, and of course she'll care to hear it,' said the little nurse. "'Next day Captain Seven was restless "'until he heard that the ordeal of Miss Twelve was over. "'It's uncertain for a week what the result will be,' said the nurse, "'but she has come through very well. "'She'll be conscious again in half an hour or so. "'Has anybody got her flowers?' eagerly asked Seven. "'No, nobody had, "'and he announced his intention of sending out for some, "'nor would he be dissuaded from the enterprise "'by certain timid protests from the nurse. "'A messenger boy was hastily dispatched with lavish orders, "'and came back laden with roses in time for twelve "'to wake up and find them in her room. "'Her eyes were bandaged,' said the nurse, but though she could not see the flowers, their fragrance told her of their presence before she heard of Captain Seven's kindness. After that, he insisted on ordering flowers every day, and the little nurse was kept busy with the exchange of messages between the rooms. So great was the fillip given by this new interest to the young man's health that his appetite improved, and soon he was able to sit up in a chaise long. That was on the day he was told that Miss Twelve was not going to lose her eyesight and by this time he felt that he knew her well enough to send up a short written note of congratulation. The nurse promised that she would be allowed to read it, but it was a delicious surprise to receive an answer, scribbled in pencil. Even the scribble was beautiful in his eyes, and the note was so charmingly expressed that it seemed to give Captain Seven a real glimpse of the character which had been so glowingly described to him. He replied, of course, within the hour, and after that a morning note and an afternoon note were invariably exchanged between rooms numbers seven and twelve. When Nurse said that Miss Twelve could read for an hour a day, Captain Seven shared his books with her, and she sent him two or three which kept, or he fancied it, a faint, adorable fragrance in their pages. He was sure that it must be Miss Twelve's favorite scent. One day, when the two had known each other in this way for nearly a fortnight, Seven summoned courage to write and ask for the goddess's photograph. It was the first and only request of his which she had denied. She was very sorry, but she had no photographs, and Seven was depressed by her refusal. He was afraid that she was angry with him for asking, and as he lay awake that night, thinking of the girl, he realized that he had fallen deeply in love with her. "'It doesn't matter that I haven't seen her,' he said to himself. "'I know that she's beautiful, but it's her soul that I'm in love with, the exquisite soul that she has put into her precious little messages and letters without knowing it.' Next morning he had a high temperature, and the little nurse was distressed. "'I thought you were almost well,' she sighed. "'But now I'm afraid we must telephone for the doctor.' "'The only medicine I need is an answer to this, the right kind of an answer,' said Captain Seven, slipping into the nurse's hand a note which he had contrived to write in the night, when he was at his worst. "'Do take it up to Miss Twelve at once, and beg her to let me have a word in return as soon as she can. Tell her I can hardly wait.' The nurse looked frightened at these signs of impetuosity, but she went away with the letter, and did not come back again for half an hour. When she did come, it would have been evident to anyone but a man absorbed in thoughts of another woman that she had been crying. Probably she had been listening to confidences from twelve. "'Here is the answer,' she said, in an odd voice, holding out one of the little three-cornered folded-over notes which had grown so familiar, and so precious. Then she stole out of the room, but the man did not even see that she had gone. He was opening the three-cornered note, and his brown hands, from which the sunburnt bronze had never worn off, were shaking a little. "'Dear Captain Seven, he read, "'I think I must go on calling you that, even though you have told me your real name, and I mustn't tell you mine because it is better for you to forget. These two weeks have been very happy for me, and it's you who have made them so, but they must be the end.' I never dreamed of what you tell me in this last letter, which has just come. Do, do forgive me, dear Captain Seven, but you must not think of me any more. There is something in my life that I can't tell you which will keep us apart. We mustn't even see each other. I do care, but all the more because I care I must go out of your life. Though I want you to forget, I shall never forget. I shall think of you, and wish beautiful and happy things for you as long as you may live. Soon I shall be gone from here, but I shall leave my thoughts behind, and they will be saying to you, Get well and strong. Be glad of all the blessings you have, and don't grieve for the few things you have lost. 
Your friend always. Twelve. Soon I shall be gone. Captain Seven said the words over to himself in alarm. She must not go. He must see her. That letter of his had been written when his feelings were at high tension, in the hour before the dawn when the whole silent room had seemed alive with thoughts of her. Of course he could not in cooler moments have expected her to answer it according to his wish. He had frightened her. But give him his chance to see the girl and plead his cause with lips and eyes. That was all he asked, and he meant to have it. He pressed the electric bell impatiently, and the little nurse came almost at once. This time he did notice that the soft, rosy face was pale. "'Has Twelve said anything to you about the letter you took up?' he inquired, almost sharply. "'No, she hasn't said anything,' the nurse answered, after a slight electric pause. "'But you know something. I see by your face that you do. Please answer.' The poor nurse blushed pitifully, until the tears were forced to her eyes. I... I can't help suspecting, she stammered. But... There isn't any but. Surely you, who have been so good, aren't going to turn against me. Oh, no, but it's no use. I'm sorry now, dreadfully sorry, that I ever told you about Twelve. I meant it for the best. I thought it would interest you to know about her, and that it would help you to get well, to hear how brave she was. So it has. And because she is so brave and so adorable, and so everything that's good... I've fallen in love with her, that's all. I must see her, whatever happens. You can't, possibly. I don't mean now, while she's here, of course. That wouldn't do. But I shall be able to get out in a day or two, you know. And she says in her letter that she's going soon. Then she has gone, already. Gone? It's not possible. It's not an hour since she wrote to me. But she was up and dressed then, and everything was ready. Please don't look like that. It will break my heart, because it's all my fault. I ought to have... Oh, don't think of her any more. You can never meet. Captain Seven flushed and paled. Why? At least I have the right to know why, he broke out. I can't tell you. She couldn't tell you. But there is a very, very good reason. I don't believe it, he insisted obstinately. After all that's passed, I can't think any reason could exist strong enough to make her so cruel to me. If she tells me that I mustn't, I won't speak of love... "'But surely, just to see her face to face. "'I told you she is gone.' "'The little nurse cut him short, with a break in her voice. "'But you, or someone in the house, "'surely have her address and can forward a letter. "'When she really understands that it's a matter of life and death to me. "'No, no, it isn't. Don't say that. "'It's the truth. "'Dear, kind little nurse, help me, won't you? "'I've only you to depend upon, because she's gone away "'and I don't even know her name. "'You know nothing. Nothing at all about her, really.' Perhaps if you'd met. I know enough about her from her messages and letters and the books and flowers she loves best and your descriptions of her to be sure she's the one woman in the world for me. Don't let me lose her without trying for my happiness. I... I'm afraid I can't do anything. But yes, I'll try, if only you won't look like that and excite yourself so much. I'll do my very best, but please let me go now. I must. She did not come back till some small duty called her to the room, and he had been for perhaps two hours alone, conscious that every minute his beloved Twelve might be receding farther and farther from him into the unknown. When she appeared, it was with quite a bustling professional air, as if nothing had happened. Well, he asked excitedly, but she answered that she must take his temperature. No, of course she had found out nothing yet. How could he expect it? She had two other patients to look after. The temperature was bad, and the doctor came, and there was cooling medicine to drink. The nurse hoped that her patient would be better in the morning, but instead he was worse, and in her guilty little soul she well knew why. "'Oh, you mustn't worry,' she said. "'I shall, every minute,' Captain Seven replied, "'till you have news for me.' "'But supposing it were bad news?' "'Even bad news would be better than none, better than suspense. "'Have you none? I believe you have.' "'For heaven's sake, tell me, or I must apply to the superintendent for Miss Twelve's real name and address.' The little nurse walked over to the window and looked out silently for a minute. Then, without any warning, she burst into tears, trying to check her sobs. "'I will tell you. I'll tell you everything,' she cried, turning suddenly upon the young man, sitting shocked and anxious in his chaise long. "'But when I've told you, you'll despise and hate me forever.' Not that that will make any difference to you, because you'll be leaving in a few days. You'll never understand. 
No man could, but I did it for the best. You needed an interest so much. I... I... Go on. There isn't any Miss Twelve. What do you mean? There was just a poor, plain, fat old lady up there. It was true about the operation on her eyes, but nothing else was. I made all the rest up, like a kind of fairy story. Captain Seven sat aghast. He felt that he must be asleep and dreaming, and that in a moment more he would wake up. Nothing else was true? he echoed slowly. Why, did you give the old lady the flowers and... and the notes? No, no, she never had the notes. The flowers, yes, because I couldn't have disposed of them in any other way, without everybody suspecting something strange. The poor old thing thought you were so kind. But the books and the notes... I kept. Who answered them? You? She hung her head. Yes, it was for your sake, to keep up your interest. I know you can never forgive me, and now I see what a dreadful mistake I made, but I didn't think at first. I made up the description of Miss Twelve according to my own ideal, and according to what I thought would please you most. There was some truth in the story I told you about her troubles. That is, it was true about another person. What was true? Oh, only the part about her father being a historian, and losing his money and being killed in a railway accident. You see, you asked me so many questions I had to think quickly, so it came easily to tell my own story. That was your story, then? Yes, but it happened years ago, just before I thought of being a nurse and went into a hospital for my training. It hasn't anything to do with this. It has something to do with it. And the other part, about the lover who jilted her and all that? That was made up. Oh, it's awful to have to tell you this. I would rather have died. But just as I made up the story to save you at first, I must unmake it to save you now, for instead of getting better you are worse. Little nurse, please stop crying and come here, said Captain Seven. I want you. She came slowly. I was in love with the woman who sent me those kind messages and sweet dear little letters. It was the beautiful soul she showed to me in them, not your description of her beautiful face that made me love her. So you see, after all, I haven't lost her. For the only difference is that instead of being in love with Miss Twelve, I'm in love with you. No, you mustn't say that. You only imagine it, sobbed the nurse. You hate me, really, and it's right you should. He caught her little soft hand. I'll show you how I hate you, he said. So that was the way it ended. For, of course... She had loved him from the beginning. End of the Love Story of Miss Twelve and Captain Seven by Mrs. C. N. Williamson The Twelve Brothers Collected by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm and published in The Red Fairy Book Edited by Andrew Lang This is a LibriVox recording read in honour of the twelfth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Twelve Brothers There were, once upon a time, a king and a queen who lived happily together, and they had twelve children, all of whom were boys. One day the king said to his wife, If our thirteenth child is a girl, all her twelve brothers must die, so that she may be very rich, and the kingdom hers alone. Then he ordered twelve coffins to be made, and filled them with shavings, and placed a little pillow in each. These he put away in an empty room, and giving the key to his wife, he bade her tell no one of it. The queen grieved over the sad fate of her sons, and refused to be comforted, so much so that the youngest boy, who was always with her, and whom she had christened Benjamin, said to her one day, "'Dear mother, why are you so sad?' "'My child,' she answered, "'I may not tell you the reason.' But he left her no peace, 
till she went and unlocked the room and showed him the twelve coffins filled with shavings and with the little pillow laid in each then she said my dearest benjamin your father has had these coffins made for you and for your eleven brothers because if i bring a girl into the world you are all to be killed and buried in them she wept bitterly as she spoke but her son comforted her and said don't cry dear mother we'll manage to escape somehow and we'll fly for our lives yes replied his mother that is what you must do go with your eleven brothers out into the wood and let one of you always sit on the highest tree you can find keeping watch on the tower of the castle if i give birth to a little son i will wave a white flag and then you may safely return but if i give birth to a little daughter i will wave a red flag which will warn you to fly away as quickly as you can and may the kind heaven have pity on you every night i will get up and pray for you in winter that you may always have a fire to warm yourselves by and in summer that you may not languish in the heat then she blessed her sons and they set out into the wood they found a very high oak tree and there they sat turn about keeping their eyes always fixed on the castle tower on the twelfth day when the turn came to benjamin he noticed a flag waving in the air but alas it was not white but blood red the sign which told them that they must all die when the brothers heard this they were very angry and said shall we forsooth suffer death for the sake of a wretched girl let us swear vengeance and vow that wherever and whenever we shall meet one of her sex she will die at our hands then they went their way deeper into the wood and in the middle of it where it was thickest and darkest they came across a little enchanted house which stood empty here they said let us take up our abode and you benjamin you are the youngest and weakest you shall stay at home and keep house for us we others will go out and fetch food so they went forth into the wood and shot hares and roe deer birds and wood pigeons and any other game they came across they always brought their spoils home to benjamin who soon learnt to make them into dainty dishes so they lived for ten years in this little house and time slipped merrily away in the meantime their little sister at home was growing up quickly she was kind-hearted and of a fair conscience and she had a gold star right in the middle of her forehead one day a big washing was going on at the palace and the girl looking down from her window saw twelve men's shirts hanging up to dry and asked her mother who in the world do those shirts belong to surely they are too small for my father and the queen answered sadly dear child they belong to your twelve brothers but where are my twelve brothers said the girl i have never even heard of them heaven alone knows in what part of the wild world they are wandering replied her mother then she took the girl and opened the locked-up room she showed her the twelve coffins filled with shavings and with the little pillow laid in each these coffins she said were intended for your brothers but they stole away secretly before you were born then she to tell all that had happened and when she had finished her daughter said do not cry dearest mother i will go and seek my brothers till i find them so she took the twelve shirts and went on straight into the middle of the big wood she walked all day long and came in the evening to the little enchanted house she stepped in and found a youth who 
marvelling at her beauty at the royal robes she wore and at the golden star on her forehead asked her where she came from and whither she was going i am a princess she answered and am seeking for my twelve brothers i mean to wander as far as the blue sky stretches over the earth until i find them then she showed them the twelve shirts which she had taken with her and benjamin saw that it must be his sister and said i am benjamin your youngest brother so they wept for joy and kissed and hugged each other again and again after a time benjamin said dear sister there is still a little difficulty for we had all agreed that any girl we met should die at our hands because it was for the sake of a girl that we had to leave our kingdom but she replied i will gladly die if by that means i can restore my twelve brothers to their own no he answered there is no need for that only go and hide under that tub till our eleven brothers come in and i'll soon make matters right with them she did as she was bid and soon the others came home from the chase and sat down to supper well benjamin what's the news they asked but he replied i like that have you nothing to tell me no they answered then he said well now you've been out in the wood all the day and i've stayed quietly at home and all the same i know more than you do then tell us they cried but he answered only on condition that you promise faithfully that the first girl we meet shall not be killed she shall be spared they promised only tell us the news then benjamin said our sister is here and he lifted up the tub and the princess stepped forward with her royal robes and with the golden star on her forehead looking so lovely and sweet and charming that they all fell in love with her on the spot they arranged that she should stay at home with benjamin and help him in the housework while the rest of the brothers went out into the wood and shot hares and roe deer birds and wood pigeons and benjamin and his sister cooked their meals for them she gathered herbs to cook the vegetables in fetched the wood and watched the pots on the fire and always when her eleven brothers returned she had their supper ready for them besides this she kept the house in order tidied all the rooms and made herself so generally useful that her brothers were delighted and they all lived happily together one day the two at home prepared a fine feast and when they were all assembled they sat down and ate and drank and made merry now there was a little garden round the enchanted house in which grew twelve tall lilies the girl wishing to please her brothers plucked the twelve flowers meaning to present one to each one of them as they sat at supper but hardly had she plucked the flowers when her brothers were turned into twelve ravens who flew croaking over the wood and the house and garden vanished also so the poor girl found herself left all alone in the wood and as she looked around her she noticed an old woman standing close beside her who said my child what have you done why didn't you leave the flowers alone they were your twelve brothers now they are changed for ever into ravens the girl asked sobbing is there no means of setting them free no said the old woman there is only one way in the whole world and that is so difficult that you won't free them by it for you would have to be dumb and not laugh for seven years and if you spoke a single word though but an hour were wanting to the time your silence would all have been in vain and that one word would slay your brothers then the girl said to herself if that is all 
I'm quite sure I can free my brothers. So she searched for a high tree, and when she had found one, she climbed up it and spun all day long, never laughing or speaking one word. Now it happened one day that a king, who was hunting in the wood, had a large greyhound, who ran sniffing to the tree on which the girl sat, and jumped round it, yelping and barking furiously. The king's attention was attracted, and when he looked up and beheld the beautiful princess with the golden star on her forehead, he was so enchanted by her beauty that he asked her on the spot to be his wife. She gave no answer, but nodded slightly with her head. Then he climbed up the tree himself, lifted her down, put her on his horse, and bore her home to his palace. The marriage was celebrated with much pomp and ceremony, but the bride never spoke nor laughed. When they had lived a few years happily together, the king's mother, who was a wicked old woman, began to slander the young queen, and said to the king, "'She is only a low-born beggar-maid that you have married. Who knows what mischief she is up to? If she is deaf and can't speak, she might at least laugh. Depend upon it, those who don't laugh have a bad conscience. At first the king paid no heed to her words, but the old woman harped so long on the subject, and accused the young queen of so many things, that at last he let himself be talked over, and condemned his beautiful wife to death. So a great fire was lit in the courtyard of the palace, where she was to be burnt, and the king watched the proceedings from an upper window, crying bitterly all the while, for he still loved his wife dearly. But just as she had been bound to the stake, and the flames were licking her garments with their red tongues, the very last moment of the seven years had come. Then a sudden rushing sound was heard in the air, and twelve ravens were seen flying overhead. They swooped downwards, and as soon as they touched the ground, they turned into her twelve brothers, and she knew she had freed them. They quenched the flames and put out the fire, and, unbinding their dear sister from the stake, they kissed and hugged her again and again. And now that she was able to open her mouth and speak, she told the king why she had been dumb and not able to laugh. The king rejoiced greatly when he heard she was innocent, and they all lived happily ever afterwards. End of The Twelve Brothers Collected by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Concerning the Twelve Houses of Heaven and Their Powers by Rosa Bourne This is a LibriVox recording, read in honour of the twelfth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The ancient astrologers divided the heavens into twelve houses. The first house. This is called the ascendant, and the planet rising therein, whether well or ill dignified, will materially affect the mind, bodily appearance, and fate of the native through his whole existence. This house is masculine, and governs the head and face of man and if the planet mars be in this house at the time of birth there will always be some blemish or mole in the face of the native if a few out of the degrees have ascended the scar or blemish is without fail on the upper part of the head if the middle part of the sign ascends the mark is in the middle of the face if the latter part of the sign is ascending the mark is near the chin this house represents the head the tongue and the memory and it governs in colours white 
the second house this house has signification of the native's wealth and worldly goods the house is feminine ruling the neck and the colour is green the third house this governs brothers and sisters short journeys neighbours letters and writings it is masculine and governs the hands arms and shoulders its colours are red and yellow mixed the fourth house this rules the father inheritances or property of the native and shows his condition at the close of life it is feminine and rules the stomach breast and lungs its colour is red the fifth house this signifies the children of the native also his success in speculation and hazardous games the pleasures he enjoys and the wealth of the father it rules the heart back and liver is masculine and represents in colour black and white mixed the sixth house this concerns the native servants sheep goats and small cattle it also signifies the father's kindred this house is feminine it rules the belly and intestines and its colour is black the seventh house gives judgment of marriage and describes the man or woman in all love questions it is masculine it rules the haunches and its colour is black the eighth house argues of death of legacies and wills also of the kind of death a man shall die it is a feminine house it rules the lower parts of the trunk of the body its colours are green and black the ninth house gives judgment on voyages and long journeys and also on events happening to the wife's kindred it rules the hips and thighs it is a masculine house its colours are green and white the tenth house is called the midheaven and is feminine this concerns the native's mother and also his calling it rules the knees and hams and its colours are red and white the eleventh house represents friends and friendship it is masculine and rules the legs the twelfth house this house is often called the evil demon for it is the house of sorrow self undoing enemies and imprisonment it governs great cattle it is feminine and rules the feet and toes and in colour it governs green the strongest houses are the first the ascendant and the tenth the midheaven the first fourth seventh and tenth are called angular houses and represent the four cardinal points of the compass thus the first is east the seventh west the fourth is north and the tenth south the second fifth eighth and eleventh houses are called succeedant houses the third sixth ninth and twelfth houses are termed cadent houses any planet posited in a cadent house is regarded as weak in its effects on the native it is necessary to have thoroughly mastered the influences of the twelve houses as well as those of the seven planets and of the signs of the zodiac before attempting to cast a nativity or to work a horary question end of concerning the twelve houses of heaven and their powers by rosa bourne